40 is a big number. James Harden's hit it 20 times this year, and now you can get 40% off at The Athletic by going to theathletic.com slash thinkingbasketball. They feature huge names like David Aldridge and John Hollinger, and also have great in-depth bubble coverage for every team. You can download the app, customize who you want to follow, and you also help support this channel by heading over to theathletic.com slash thinkingbasketball for that 40% off. On January 27, 2020, the Houston Rockets took small ball to a whole new level. No one in their starting lineup stood over six foot six. Three of them were six three, and yet, without James Harden and Russell Westbrook that night, this diminutive starting lineup defeated the red hot Utah Jazz. A few days later, Houston traded away its starting center, and micro ball was officially born. The lingering question since then is whether this extreme breed of small ball actually works and if it's here to stay. Mike D'Antoni first went small in 2005 with the 7 Seconds or Less Suns, moving Amari Stoudemire to center and Sean Marion to the big forward slot, but we've never really seen a starting lineup with zero traditional big men before. The Rockets asked Robert Covington, Jeff Green, or even P.J. Tucker to nominally play the five, but they aren't trying to replicate a traditional center's role. For instance, Houston really likes to run this inverted pick and roll with Harden as the screener and Green as the ball handler. This is not something most centers can do, so it punishes less mobile big men who can't hang with Green and his ball handling. This action also leverages James Harden's screening gravity, occupying his defender who usually spends half-court possessions obsessing about how to guard him. On the other end, Robert Covington offers some rim protection for the Rockets. Our video coordinator Mike went deep on Covington if you're interested, but he can rotate into the paint quickly without creating mismatches most of the time. And this means the Rockets can switch judiciously without being targeted for these mismatches, which is more of a defensive strength than a weakness. It's a similar phenomenon to what the Warriors cultivated with Draymond Green and three switchy wings in their death lineup. You can see here just how much the Rockets will switch. This almost looks like a zone, it's so frequent. The Rockets will just switch ball screens up top like this all the time. And Houston then fronts the post when an interior mismatch pops up, which almost leads to a turnover and the whole trip fizzles out. The Rockets have these physically sturdy guards like Harden and Gordon who can prevent post players from finding deep position, although that doesn't work every time and someone like Montrez Harrell can exploit Houston a bit inside. Another potential weakness of microball is on the glass, where the Rockets give up rebounds because of their size, and since the Covington trade, they've grabbed about 72% of available defensive boards, which is the second lowest rate in the league in that span. Yet despite all this, for such a small team, the results are pretty good. Houston was 12th in defensive rating from the time of the trade until the shutdown, and 7th among the 22 teams in defense in the seeding games inside the bubble. Those are pretty encouraging results for an offensively slanted lineup, only the Rockets haven't been killing it on offense. We'll look at the numbers in a moment, but one of the primary benefits of going small is filling the court with shooters. This allows five three-point weapons to finish plays at any moment, and Houston's five-out spacing gives players room to attack empty lanes, namely James Harden. And this isn't all static isolation or basic spread pick and roll where everyone stands around. The Rockets will use motion to occupy help defenders and pull them out of the paint. This is especially creative because staggered screens like this is a common league-wide action, but the Rockets are using it like a backup plan while clearing space for Harden to cook. They also vary how they set screens. This is the same motion a minute later, but Tucker floats to the elbow to set a back screen on this defender, and that makes the weak side pretty difficult to defend. Here's another way to distract defenses. Green zips from the corner to set the back screen, and now there's one lone defender to help in all this space and to protect the corner, and that extra space helps guards like Gordon finish. They also like to involve Westbrook and Harden in pick and roll together to get Russell headed to the rim, and he can create in those spots as well. 
Here's Westbrook in five out. And again, notice the activity on the wings, which makes it easier for Russ to get deep and then kick it out for a high percentage shot. D'Antoni has built a system around Harden that works incredibly well. He can torch most defenders in the league by oscillating between a three-point shot or a drive to the rim. When help comes on a drive, Harden kicks it out and the Rockets can find one of those three-point shooters. In that sense, the micro ball offense is working because without Westbrook on the court, the Rockets have had a 117 offensive rating since the trade with a healthy plus 6.4 net rating. And Harden's quietly put up monster numbers in that span, 35 points per 75 on 65% true shooting when Westbrook's on the bench. Even with league-wide efficiency at an all-time high, those are impressive results, and notably, Harden is created like a machine in these spots. So again, the Harden part of this equation is working. However, with Westbrook in the fold, the Rockets haven't played as well. And what jumps out to me is that Harden's offensive load plummets next to Russell. Harden does just about all of the heavy lifting when he's the lone star on the court. Westbrook replicates that heavy lifting when he's alone, but... When they play together, they both reduce their direct involvement and split the load. With Westbrook next to Harden, the Rockets have a plus 4.2 net rating with a slightly worse offense. But because Westbrook is a poor outside shooter, he's not going to punish teams who help off him in the paint. D'Antoni and staff have adjusted by using him in the short roll to take advantage of his passing and downhill rim pressure. And against teams that want to trap Harden, this makes Westbrook a really nice value add. Still, there's the issue of shooting in general, beyond just Westbrook's 29% over the last three seasons. Take a look at the Rocket players by percentage. Ben McLemore has been a bright spot at 40%, but after that, P.J. Tucker, Austin Rivers, and Daniel House are around 36%. Jeff Green is a career 33% three-point shooter. Harden's slightly above average on catch-and-shoot triples that come back to him. And then Eric Gordon is shooting 32% from downtown. Robert Covington is at 32%. Add in Westbrook, and the Rockets finish the regular season 24th in the NBA in three-point percentage. In short, they aren't a good shooting team. One way they've tried to circumvent this is by using the short corner three more. Tucker, Rivers, and House are all much better shooters from the corners. 23% of all threes in the league came from the corner this year, but for the Rockets, they take almost a third of their threes from the corner, matched only by the Jazz. Coach Daniel had a great video recently looking at how the Celtics defended Harden this year, and while he focused on forcing Harden middle into extra defenders, I think a real key to the Brad Stevens strategy was prioritizing above the break threes over corner threes. With a vanilla five out defense, teams will send this defender on the back line, exposing the corner, which can lead to a higher percentage three point shot for the Rockets. I think the reason the Celtics were comfortable playing Harden by cheating in a pass away is because the Rockets lack good three point shooters and it's way better to give up one from above the break to them than in the corner. Add it all up, and somewhat surprisingly, the Rockets' offense was only ninth in the league since their shift to microball this year, and they've had the fourth worst offense in the bubble. I think what we're looking at here is a Ferrari with a Prius engine. In other words, the shell of microball is there, the promise is there, but these weapons aren't as sharp as they could be. And so while this particular rendition of Microball might miss the mark slightly, the results are still promising. Their defense held up well, and if the offense were filled with better shooters, the team's net rating would be closer to that of a title contender. And so even without a championship run in the 2020 playoffs, I don't think this is the last we've seen of Microball. Remember to check out that deal at The Athletic. It's a great way to support this channel, theathletic.com slash thinkingbasketball. To also support this channel, you can head on over to patreon.com slash thinkingbasketball. There's additional content, articles, discussion forums, and more. Thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. As always, I hope you are having a great day.